This lecture is part of the Water and Snow and Ice Unit in Water in the West, and it's about the basics of snow water equivalent measurement. So by the end of this lecture, uh, you should be able to do the following. Describe what snow water equivalent represents. Explain how a common snow sampling tool works. List some key steps in measuring snow water equivalent or SWE. And demonstrate how snow depth can change, but SWE actually will remain the same. So this variable snow water equivalent or SWE uh, that you will be he hearing frequently throughout the course of your undergraduate work is effectively the equivalent volume of liquid water in a snow sample per unit area of snowpack. And I'm going to show you what this means in two different ways. First, I'm going to show you the mathematical representation of what snow water equivalent is, and then I'm going to illustrate it in a more graphical way. So if I bring up the equation that defines what SWE or snow water equivalent is, this is the equation. So on the left hand side of the equation here we have snow water equivalent or SWE and that is equal to the ratio of the density of my snowpack to the density of liquid water times the depth of the snow. So let's go ahead and write out what those terms are. I'll turn my pen here on. Okay, so SWE is my snow water equivalent. Um, rho S is my snow density. And that's going to be in units of uh, kilograms per meters cubed. Uh, rho sub W is uh, liquid water density. And that is in units of kilograms per meters cubed. And uh, it's a constant, so it's a it's a thousand kilograms per meter cubed. And HS here is my snow depth, which is usually expressed in millimeters, but in general is uh, a, a length variable, variable uh, length dimension. So you'll also see this uh, in the NRCS data reported in units of, of inches in imperial units. Okay. All right. So let's talk about this real quick before we show the graphical representation of SWE. So SWE is, is in, in essence, what we as hydrologists care about, right? This is how much water is in the snowpack, how much water is in the snowpack. So if, if we are oops, snowpack, um, if we as hydrologists are interested in, um, for instance, how much water we might have to grow crops or to, to uh, supply fisheries um, or for boating, um, in, in the spring and summer runoff season, uh, we really want to know the volume of water that is stored in our snowpack in a watershed. And SWE is exactly a representation of that. And um, it actually has units associated with it, and they are the same as depth. And we'll talk about why that is in a second or how to conceptually think about that. Um, but uh, because if you see here, SWE is just equal to the ratio of the snow density to the water, the density of liquid water times the, the 
the snow depth, these density uh, units will cancel out. Um, you're multiplying a dimensionless number that's actually between zero and one um, times a depth, and you will get um, you'll get also something that has a unit of depth. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, um, this this ratio here. Okay, I just mentioned in passing that um, this has to be less than one, right? And if you look at this, you can you can sort of understand that, right? Uh, you're starting off with a snowpack. That snowpack, you know, could be super dry, like the kind of snow you get in Colorado. It could be super wet, the kind of snow that you would get in the Sierras, for instance, in the late spring. But the density of snow will will never exceed the density of of water. And as such, this value, um, this ratio, is always going to be less than one, right? So you can think of this as kind of the percentage of the snowpack that is represented in the liquid water phase if you melted it all down, right? And um, because we're, we are taking this ratio and multiplying it by the depth of snow, what we're saying is that the snow water equivalent is basically um, the product of the snow depth and the fraction of that snow depth that is liquid water, right? And that is controlled by the snow density, okay? So, um, so the, the important thing to understand here as well is that um, snow depth is easy to measure, right? So this is an easy parameter to measure. You just go out with essentially a glorified ruler um, and you can measure the snow depth, okay? But what this says is that, okay, well, hold on a second. Um, you need some estimate of the snow density or you know, more directly the, the ratio of the snow density to, the, to liquid water to get at, um, to get at how much water content you have in that snow. Okay, so so we need this in order to get SWE. Okay, so the question is is, um, is how to get that, right? And that's what we're gonna be covering in subsequent slides. So um, again, just to reiterate, if I, right, if I represent this, let me erase my, um, my scratches here. So um, this is a graphical representation of what snow water equivalent is right so the idea here is that just as an example um, we have 10 units of depth of snow this could be 10 inches it could be um, you know could be uh, 10 decimeters right this could be a meter right um, and um, and so this is our depth of snow so this is h this is hs right um, and um, th in this specific case we're saying well hey um, Let's say that 20% of that is 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 liquid water, right? Or or that if you melted it down, 20% um, the, the the depth of this would be 20%, right? So this is this is our ratio of rho sub s to rho sub water, right? Equals 0 0.20, and this here this is our snow water equivalent, right? And that is equal to 0 0.20 times 10 units of depth, and that equals two units, as you see here, right? Okay, so, but that still begs the question, okay, where does this number come from, right? Is this just a constant? Um, is, is, is snow always 20%? You know, if we, if we melted it if we melted a foot down of snow, would would we always get sort of 20% of a foot in terms of liquid water, um, you know, or or do we need to do something else? And the answer is that yes, we we need to do something else. We need to be able to measure um, this snow density, and that's where this tool called um, a federal sampler. So um, if you look down here, this is. Uh, this is what's known as a federal snow sampler. And it's called a federal snow sampler because this is effectively what the NRCS um, sort of as its standard practice uses in measuring the snow water equivalent. And it has a number of pieces, but basically, um, you know, you can you can put all of these into basically a, a folding bag and um, 
zip it up and take it out to the field um, and use it to measure um, the snow water equivalent. And we'll talk about how in a second. But before doing that, I want to just sort of describe some key important parts of the federal snow sampler here. Okay, so so what you have here is um, you have uh, five five tubes, and each of these tubes um, screws together, right? So tube two screws into the top of tube one, and it is important to keep the tubes in kind of the correct order here, because if you see here, um, the um, the the tube number one starts at it basically one inch and goes up in units of, of inches. This is in units of of inches um, because this was designed, you know, back in the first half of the 20th century by what was the um, the predecessor to the NRCS. Um, so it goes in up in units of, of inches, right? And so um, depending on the depth of snow, you can use additional tubes. You can screw tube two and two into uh, tube one. You can screw tube three into tube two and on and on and on um, to get up until, you know, you you are reaching, say, 150 inches of snow, which is which is quite a bit, right? So um, so these do go in order. Important thing to see here, right down here, um, tube number one has uh, a little bit of a, um, a, a spaded bit to it, right? It has a little bit like an auger head to it. And um, the idea behind that is that you know, you, you want to be able to drill into the snow pack and you want the snow to go, you want to produce an intact snow core as much as possible. So you want to be able to force the snow into this without compacting the, the snow, right? So um, so what you wind up doing is, is sort of twisting this, sn um, this the snow sampler into the snow pack with this auger bit here so that, you know, you're not compacting the snow as you're, as you're drilling this, as you're pushing this into the snow pack, okay? Um, you can see down here, um, this is the handle, right? So depending on how many tubes um, you have, you fasten this to the top of your um, uh, to the top of your uh, um, whatever tube you're using, and you you clamp it down, and uh, you use this as a as a as a twisting a mechanism for twisting, right? So these often um, uh, um, are sort of scored so that you can grip them easily and uh, twist them into the use it to twist the snow tubes into the snowpack. Um, and then um, the other thing that's important here, right, is so we're actually going to, to push this snow core up into our federal sample sampler, and then we're going to take it out. And um, we're going to, it's going to be important to take a weight measurement of our, um, of our snow core. And so uh, what comes with this is a little cradle, and this cradle uh, basically holds the snow, the snow tube with the intact snow core inside of it, and um, a, a little spring scale. And I'll talk about how those work in a second. But basically, um, you you use this spring scale. Um, you hold it up in the air. You attach uh, the the cradle to it. You set the snow tube in with the snow core inside of it, and you take a weight measurement. And that's going to be one of the ways that we get to. Um, uh, that we uh, get to our measurement of snow density. So um, one question might be, well, what is this thing made up of? And it looks like it might be metal. Um, and how do we actually, you know, how do you see through metal to figure out, you know, how what the snow depth actually is? And um, you might be able to see these uh, these little kind of lines right here. I'll, I'll kind of circle one. Right, and I'm going to show you on the next slide exactly what these correspond to. So here's an actual photograph of what a federal uh, snow sampler tube looks like. Right, so here is tube number one with this uh, with this bit down here. Um, you can see kind of the threadings on the tube. Those kind of fit into um, you know into the into the tube below it. Right, so this this is how these go together. Here's that cradle that I was talking about. And here's the handle. Um, so the if you take a look at these um, these little slits here, they are offset from one another, right? So we have three right here. So there's one, two, three, and then basically 90 degrees offset from those three slits, we have another set of slits. We'll call these uh, one, 
two and three down here. And if you if you look at it closely, um, these basically overlap by about a half an inch or so, right? So um, so no matter what, no matter how far the snow goes up in here, you basically use this to sort of peek into the tube to figure out um, where the top of the, the snow is, right? And that's how you get your measurement of, of snow depth with this core. Okay, so um, this is sort of what this, you know, you find pictures like this all over the place um, uh, in, um, you know, when you, when you type in sort of snow, snow measurement, right? Um, this is what the, this is what a, 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 the, the federal sampler, the tube looks like as it's sort of being, you know, drilled into the, the surface of the snowpack. Um, here uh, you have two NRCS personnel uh, demonstrating how you, you know, use the, the cradle right here with this spring scale um, to measure the, the weight of this, um, the weight of the snow tube with the snow core inside of it, right? So this is how you get a manual measurement of the snow water equivalent. Um, for those of you that have never seen a spring scale, um, I was fortunate enough to sort of first see this in my like high school physics class. Um, sometimes these are called Newton meters, right? So sometimes you might actually have them in like your college physics lab. Um, but uh, and those of you that are maybe um, those of you that are anglers, for instance, or like, you know, uh, like bass, you know, people that fish bass and stuff like these are frequently used to, to measure, to weigh fish, basically, especially when you're doing sort of catch and release, right? You want to sort of weigh the fish, um, you want to get an easy way of measuring it out on a boat or out in the field without, you know, having to drag a scale out. So th this is what's referred to as a spring scale. It works according to Hooke's law. Um, and what Hooke's law says is that basically, you know, the weight, so, you know, this is basically hung somewhere. Um, you you, you uh, attach something that you want to get the weight of here, right? And it pulls down on this string. And if you can see here, there's a bunch of graduations on this spring scale right here. And the top of this plunger basically shows not only how far the, um, the spring has been depressed or stretched, but through Hooke's law, this um, this allows us to figure out what the weight of that uh, what the weight of that sample is, right? So what Hooke's law says is that the force that's pulling on this, right, or the weight of whatever is pulling on this spring scale is just equal to something called the spring constant. times the, this is the length of displacement, right? Um, and it's not important to know what the spring constant is in this case. And in fact, if you check this out, um, you know, this is basically increasing units of weight, right? So the smaller sp spring is used for sort of measuring things that weigh less. The, the bigger springs are used for weighing things that that weigh more. Um, the, the key insight here is that um, by measuring the distance that this plunger here travels down as, as, you, as it pulls on um, the hook here, um, by measuring the distance displaced because the, sp the spring constant is a constant, you're effectively measuring the, the force, right? Um, so what we're interested in is, is not necessarily um, the weight um, if we just go back to this image real quick and you take a look at the, the folks that are measuring this, the snow tube. Um, so, you know, there's snow inside of here and then there's this, this tube weighs something non-negligible itself because um, it's metal, right? It's, it's like stainless steel. Um, and so anytime you're going out and measuring um, snow to try and get at density, um, you, you need to take two weight measurements, right? So um, in step two, you need to, to put the tube together and you need to, to, to measure the weight of the tube, right? And so you, know, you might wanna do that if you're uncertain that sort of how, how deep the snow is, uh, you, want, you might wanna sort of screw together a couple of those different tubes and take a couple of different uh, weights depending on how far you're gonna have to push that tube into the snowpack. So the first step is to weigh that empty tube, right? Um, then you you go ahead and you you uh, 
push the tube into the snowpack, you slowly pull out your sample, um, and then you um, and then you go ahead and weigh the the tube with the snow inside of it. And um, if you just think about this, right, the weight of the snow, right, is just equal to the, the weight of the tube plus the snow minus the weight of the tube itself, right? So the difference in weight between um, that you, the difference in weight between, you know, what, what you took with the snow inside and what you took with just the, the, um, just the tube itself has to be equal to the weight of the snow, right? The weight of the snow is what resulted in an increase in weight um, between the time that you uh, pulled it out of the, the storage sack and loaded it up with snow, okay? So that's how we get the, the weight of the snow in the tube. And then, um, you know, depending on what units you're using, you want to uh, divide by G to get the actual snow mass. Okay, so then, um, all right, that's great. We have the weight of the snow in the tube. Um, how do we ultimately get the density of the snow? And um, the density of the snow, right, is just equal to the, the, the mass, right? By definition, the density of the snow is just equal to the mass of the snow. So this is the mass of the snow divided by the volume of the snow, okay? Okay, well, we, we measured this, right? That's, that's exactly what we used the spring scale for. We measured the, the mass of the snow or the weight of the snow, right? Um, so the question is, is, well, you know, how do we get the volume? Well, um, the volume is just equal to, right, if this is my, um, my federal sampler tube right here, right, and uh, this, is, this is the depth of my snow inside the tube, the volume of the snow is just equal to the volume of this of a cylinder, right? Um, and the volume of a cylinder is just equal to the area of the circle on the top and bottom of the of the cylinder, right? Which in this case is just pi times the the radius of the tube squared, right? Um, so this is the area of that that circle here, right? That's the area of this circle. And then um, to get the area of that cylinder, we just multiply by the, the depth of the snow, right? So the depth of the snow. This is our volume of the snow, okay? So, and that's what you see right here, right? So this is the, this right here is the volume of the cylinder of snow inside the sampler, right? Um, so this, you know, based on the things that we measured, we measured this, we measured the, you know, this, this we know from the tube, um, we can get our snow density. Um, and uh, from from there, right, we, we now have everything that we need to calculate uh, the snow water equivalent. So we, we just calculated the, the snow density as a product of some things that we measured. We measured the snow depth and um, the, the density of water is a constant 1000 kilograms per meter cubed, right? So you definitely need to make sure that um, these are in the, in units of, um, in units of, uh, the densities are in consistent units, right? So if you're using a thousand kilograms per meter cubed for the density of water, if you're using one gram per cubic centimeter, right? You just need to make sure that your snow density is correspondingly in the same units. Um, and the good check for this is that your ratio of snow density to water density should come out to be less than one, right? And, and frequently um, it's, you know, at a maximum often sort of maybe 0.4, sometimes maybe 0.5 with really, really wet snow, right? So if ever this this ratio here is more than one, it's a good hint that you have a units issue here that uh, you need to sort out. So, um, you know, one, one thing here too, right, is uh, you might ask, well, you know, why can't we just assume a constant? You know, isn't the isn't the density of snow constant? Why are we measuring it, right? And indeed, you know, a lot of times, 
folks have sort of an intuitive notion of what snow water equivalent is because you know you might talk to sort of old farmers and they'd say okay well you know i figure if i get you know um you know 30 inches of snow that is about three inches of water for me right so the the baked in assumption there is that this that ratio would be 10 percent um but it, is that true can um why can, why can't we just assume that snow density is constant. And the reason for that is actually that um, the, the snowpack is, is undergoing a set of um, what in the snow science community are referred to as metamorphic or metamorphosis processes um, uh, as they sit there, right? And there's a couple of different reasons for that. Um, one is just that snow weighs a certain amount, right? So um, snow has a mass to it. And so it has this effect of gravity pulling down on the snowpack. And if you think about what, what the snowpack is comprised of, it's just comprised of a, a bunch of snowflakes together, right? So it's just a bunch of fallen snowflakes. And over time, the weight of that snowpack ultimately serves to, to grind off the edges of those snow those snowflakes, um, it serves to, to round them, and it causes a compaction, right? A compaction of of the snowpack, um, and so that that's one one reason, right? So the the weight of the snowpack is actually pulling on and and uh, destroying those snowflakes that are inside of the the snowpack. Um, the other thing that's that's important um, is is this here, this idea of vapor diffusion. So one of the kind of really interesting things about snow science is that uh, the, the snowpack here actually serves to be a, um, a blanket on, on the ground, right? So at the, at the ground surface here, often the temperature um, with a big snowpack on top of it uh, often is not much less than zero degrees Celsius, if, if at all, right? It usually hovers right around zero degrees Celsius. And so it's actually a bit warmer than the snowpack above it, right? So the snowpack above it, um, at least during the, the accumulation phase, the temperature will often be less than zero degrees Celsius, right? So the, the underlying ground is actually warmer than the, the snowpack above it. And as a consequence of that, um, you get this diffusion or you get this movement of vapor through the pore spaces inside the snowpack that actually serves to also um, destroy those the, the shape and kind of sand down, you can think of it as the snow pla sn snowflakes in that snowpack, right? And so as a result of that, um, this vapor diffusion process, right, which is a product of um, heat loss from the ground surface up through the snowpack will serve to also um, metamorphosize those snowflakes. So what are the net consequences of this? Well, if we go back to our SWE equation here, right, what that means is that um, let's say that we have some period of time in which no new snowfall has actually occurred, but um, our, um, you know, our snowpack has just been sitting there under its own weight and with, you know, vapor kind of moving up through the snowpack and causing the crystals in the snowpack to round and become more spherical through time. And that causes the snowpack to, to compress or compact on itself. Um, what that means is that our snow density will go up, right? Um, this is called densification, right? So our, our snow density will actually go up through time as a product of these metamorphic processes. But as I've just said, right, we, we're not, we're assuming, if we assume that there's, you know, no losses or gains in the actual amount of water, right, that, that um, there's no precipitation coming into the snowpack. Um, so let me write these assumptions down. So no precip, no melt. So let's assume for the moment, right, uh, no precip, no melt, no sublimation. So no, no loss of, of water in the vapor phase from the snowpack sublimation. Okay, so there's no gain or loss in snow water equivalent. If the, the snow density goes up, 
the snow depth has to go down, right? And in fact, this is what you see in some snow packs, right? So if we look at snow depth through time, you know, um, and again, there's a this is a period when there's no precipitation, no melt, right? You'll see kind of this decay or this compaction in the snow snowpack through time, right? And this is a result of the density itself going up, right? So if I draw the density here in a different color, right, this would mean that the density goes up. This is my rho sub s, okay? So that's the process of snow densification. And this is why uh, we can't just go out and measure snow depth alone uh, in order to get an estimate of, of snow water equivalent because the snow density and the snow depth are not constant through time even when there's no precipitation or no melt or no sublimation.